It's great to be back for another episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders and executives and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. Paul Edwards, back again once, back again once again, saying again too many times, with my partner in crime, my friend, uh, my other half at Emissary, I guess you would call him, Jason Todd. Jason, great to have you back on the show as well, my friend. I love this intro. I love the, that uh, it's not perfect. Uh, and, and here's why I love it. And you didn't plan this, which is totally fine. But to all of our viewers and listeners, this idea of having to put something out in the world that's perfect sometimes stops them. And I think also, like we're going to talk about today uh, with Dennis Volpe's book, Transition on Purpose, the, the process of transition is full of all sorts of error. Mm -hmm. And yet... We have to transition. We have to move on to something new. We can't stay necessarily where we're at. So I love that intro and I'm happy to be here today. Well, I guess it's a good thing that I, uh, that I, I ran that one to ground because, uh, we're gonna, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna chat about that today with my old friend, uh, and Jason's new one, Dennis Volpe. Dennis, great to have you with us on the show. My friend, how are you? Great. Great to be here, Paul. I, you know, I've, I've been looking forward to this, uh, since we chatted last. So uh, great, great to be on here with you and Jason. And it's been far too long. I don't remember that it was probably 2021 the last time we were face to face. And uh, yeah. I'm just glad I still have your phone number and uh, you're just a text message away. Uh, yes, sir. Community like this. So, so um, Dennis and I go back a few years, just as a little bit of uh, a little bit of introduction here, we got to know each other through the iron sharpens iron mastermind. And then uh, I was very fortunate in that uh, he wanted to create an extension, uh, sort of a, a workbook, accompanying workbook, I guess you would call it, for um, Transition on Purpose, which is his book. So he uh, graciously offered me the opportunity to help him do that. And uh, we got to know each other very well through that process. And, um, and then we just stayed in touch. And because we were both uh, veterans, and we spoke a lot of the same language, although I'm a landlubber army, and uh, you know that necessarily creates some sort of uh, friction humor in between us now and then. Uh, for the most part, we we really saw eye to eye. So, um, so uh, Dennis, let's let's let you lead off with the story. I prefer to hear it uh, straight from you. Uh, why this book? Why? I mean, you wrote it a few years ago, but when you wrote it, why did you write it? What was what was driving you? Well, and Paul, I know you and I have talked about this on, on more than one occasion. Um, you know, my story uh, is is not unique uh, in any way, but it's it's very very personal. And I get asked often, "Hey, why did you write a book?" And uh, you know, I could give you the absolute you know altruistic answer and say, you know what, I had a story that I needed people to know, people to hear, people to digest. So that way you could move them in a positive direction in their life. Yes. And I also had a bunch of friends, a bunch of mentors that said, you need to write a book. Mm -hmm. So what was really the motivation is to get them to stop telling me to write a book. <laughs> so, you know, you had the absolute answer of yes. You know what? There's a story that needs to be told. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's an impactful story, but you know what? I need to stop some of this noise relative to, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. You need to tell your story and actually do it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a great reason. Uh, we get a lot of people like that and truth be told, this is, this is one of the key uh, things that we emphasize over and over to authors is that regardless of most of the time, right, our stories are born uh, in a combination of pain and joy. But uh, the pain is only wasted if we waste it. Um, sure. You have a choice of whether or not to make positive use of the things that happened to you or the things that you did or the things that you went through, uh, specifically so you can benefit others around you. And I really, I, I, you know, I know some of the people that we're talking about there that were probably on your case. They're, they're thinking the same thing, right? That no, that story is inside you and we want to read about it. And, and not just us, but other people want to read about it because of the impact 
and the and the power it can have to help us navigate beyond where we sometimes get stuck. No, hundred percent. And uh, I know we chatted a little bit before things started, and um, you know, Jason talked about that. We always have to transition. Mm-hmm. I would actually say no, no. We always should transition. No, yeah. we don't always transition because transition is a choice. Yeah. A choice that we get to make. You know, change is the fact, right? There's always going to be change. Yeah. But it's it's our ability to make an informed decision about what matters to us that allows us you know, to do that internal thing, right? To mm-hmm. connect our head, connect our head and our heart so that way we can intentionally move forward faster. One of the things that's I'm hearing uh, which Paul talked about is this idea of pull through and push through. So sometimes we we begin speaking with family, friends, uh, confidants, and they begin to pull that story from us. They want more. And I think that pull through is a signal for a direction we need to walk in rather than the opposite, which is a lot of pushing. Hey, I've got a story to tell. Hey, I've got a story to tell. Hey, I've got a story to tell. You know, like somebody knocking on your door all the time. It's like, go away. I don't need you. But when, when you got that pull through, what did that feel like? How did you know that that was the direction that you, you went in or needed to go in? I think it was a function of uh, probably more than, more than one thing. But I, I think the biggest thing is when you start thinking about transition and transition itself, and you think about some of the models that are out there, you know, it looks at performance. And when you're in some sort of transition, whether it's career, life, or whatever, your performance actually slumps a bit. And at that point in time, I actually kind of knew that my performance, personally and professionally, had slumped a bit. Hmm. And the reason it did was because of not paying enough attention to that push through and that pull through. And once I started paying attention, and once I started listening to the music, if you will, it allowed me to make connections that I hadn't made before. And mm-hmm. when I was able to make those connections, it was easier to actually move in a positive direction. Okay, so that performance slump, let's talk about this. Because I think that uh, particularly folks who are high performing, or consider themselves high performing, right? Transition is sometimes difficult because they can sense that performance slump. And so they either, like you talk about, are sort of hell-bent on staying on the path that they're on. Like, I'm going to hold this together. This is going to happen for me, right? Uh, and they become sort of hardened, I want to, I think. Or uh, when they feel like, hey, I've got to make some sort of transition accepting that performance slump is i think a process of humility it's a process of humility um it's also being resilient uh when i think about the the work that i get to do as as a coach i've had the opportunity to coach across the spectrum you know from from you know the transitioning you know e8 in the army to you know that 03 in the Navy, to that 07 or 08 in the Navy, to corporate folks, to small business owners and everything else. And you know, just one of the things that you highlighted is one of the key stumbling blocks for everybody that's going through some sort of transition. And it's confusing endurance or perseverance and grit with resilience. Absolutely, endurance and and perseverance and grit are part of resilience. But when you think about it, resilience is kind of like grit endurance 2.0, right? Because you add a little bit of emotional intelligence to it. So you understand where you're at. You understand where you want to go and, and, the, and the junk in between, right? The gap in between, and it was what you have to attack. And very often that's connecting your head and your heart. 
You know, Dennis, you just said something. It sort of answered the next question I was going to ask, but I'm going to tell you what the question was anyway, just so the audience can hear it. Because what occurred to me, right, is you say I was going through a slump. And I think a lot of people might be tempted to think a slump means, well, I was making less money this year than I was last year. And that can be one measurement of it, right? But there, there are times, and I've experienced them myself, where I'm not, I'm making less money than I was, but boy, it doesn't feel like it. It feels like I'm just exploding with, you know, like all I'm firing on all eight cylinders. Everything's going right. I know the trajectory is going in the right direction and I'm not, I'm not worried about the money at all. And so I like that you distinguish, uh, grit and perseverance from resilience, because I think, uh, grit and pers I've had grit and perseverance during some pretty dark seasons that seem to have no end but I didn't, but I was not resilient. I, I allowed that stuff to compound and weigh me down. And it wasn't until I dealt with that, <clears throat> that I developed the kind of resilience that I feel now so that I can go through mountains and valleys. And when I'm in the, when that valley bottoms out, I can say, well, I've been here before and I know this doesn't last forever. And I know another mountaintop is coming. And, um, also, uh, you know, I, I have the self-awareness to go through both and, and treat the two imposters just the same as Rudyard Kipling would say. Yeah. And, you know, when you think about, you know, what, cause you just highlighted a whole bunch of stuff when it comes to, you know, resilience right there, there is absolutely a self-awareness part, mm -hmm. but, and there's also a reflection part and those two are co-joined, Right. Cause you can't have one without the other. Yeah. And um, when you take the time to reflect and raise your self-awareness to understand, okay, who am I? What really matters to me? And I think to, to answer both, you know, your question and Jason's question is how have I defined success for me? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, there was a LinkedIn post earlier today that talked about, run the race you're in mm -hmm. and run your own race was, you know, what I talked about after. And, you know, because when you're running the race you're in, you know, you're present in the present. Yeah. And then when you're running your own race, not anybody else's race, you're connecting your head, you're connecting your heart. You're actually taking, you know, being present in the present but also being focused on what you have defined as success. Yes. Then you've got focus, you've got alignment, and you can move faster with whatever you're trying to do. Yeah. Because it's like, um, I, 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 shared, I, I keep trying to share this with my sons. You know, my older son plays on a hockey team now. And I tell him, don't ever give up being the best you can be just because you can't be best in the world. Right. He's comparing with all these other kids that he's playing with and these kids that play at higher levels. And I'm like, yeah, I know that, but you can't be them. You can only be you. So yeah. don't stop trying to be the best that you can be and don't give up the opportunity to improve, to be, to discover what you're truly capable of just because other, other kids seem better at it than you are. Yeah. That's pointless. I mean, compare it. And I think Theodore Roosevelt said it. Uh, but comparison is the thief of joy. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So, so when, you know, we talked about one of the stumbling blocks, right? Being confusing endurance and perseverance, you know, endurance, perseverance with resilience. The other one is, you know, not defining success for you personally and professionally because of that endurance piece, that perseverance piece. You know what? I'm just going to jump on this treadmill of life and I'm going to start going. Not exactly sure where I'm going, but I'm yeah. just going to keep going. Yeah. And, um, okay. So how have you, and it, when you don't do that, or let's, let's jump into the positive, right? When you do take the time, reflect and do that deep head work and heart work that says, this is how I define success for me. Hmm. It allows you to move forward faster. Yeah. It allows you to get out of that slump. Because you may be in that slump because you know what? You are running somebody else's race. 
I mean, you didn't have a, you, 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 without a vision, right? Like, I think that's sort of what you're getting at without a, a clear picture of what without it looks like to, 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 yeah, to succeed as you, to succeed as Dennis Fulpe, Paul Edwards, Jason Todd. <clears throat> um, it's the same old thing. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. <laughs> but you could end up there crashing and burning. And um, it's uh, it's nothing like what you thought it would be, if you even gave it any thought to begin with. Right. Yeah, I think the uh, concept of living life by default comes up in my mind. Uh, cu coupled with the, the, I think what you're talking about is if, if you don't know uh, what the target is, you don't know when you've hit it. And I think, uh, one of the, don't know when you missed it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm curious when you were thinking of this book, you had, obviously had some personal things going on that you needed to, to work out in this book, but then there's, uh, there's all sorts of things externally to you. And I'm curious as you were thinking about the book and the concepts of the book, you're getting feedback that you should write a book. So you're telling stories to these folks. Uh, how did you determine the audience that is gonna, that you felt was going to read this book and therefore the message that you wanted to convey to them? Because I think those two, and I link those two questions on purpose, the audience and the message. How did you, what was your thought process as you worked through that? So I was, I was lucky enough to go through the Columbia uh, University Executive Coaching Program. And, you know, they, they've got a framework um, that's a three-step framework, so easy enough that Paul, even a Navy guy can understand it, right? And um, it, it looks at, you know, what's up, what matters, and what's next. Mm. And those are the big three, you know, overarching questions that you need to be able to answer for yourself if you want if you want to coach yourself or if you're in any sort of coaching environment, right? What's my reality? What's my desired reality? And then what's the work in the middle? Um, mm. So when I, when I started thinking about, well, who's in transition? And... At first, I was like, oh, this needs to be, you know, aimed at military veterans. And um, I had some mentors. I had had some friends say, hey, dude, military men and women aren't the only ones that are in transition. Mm -hmm. Sure, that, you know, the transition from military service to civilian life is, is a difficult one, um, or it can be a difficult one. But there's a, a lot of people that are in career and life transition. And so at first, I was pretty deep in terms of who is this specific audience. And then when I actually started to explore the whole subject of transition, it actually opened up the audience. So when I think about the, uh, the transition on purpose framework, um, it, it actually applies to a larger audience than I initially thought. Mm. So um, as you're watching, as you're hearing that, Dennis, you're hearing people talk about um, we're in transition too. I'm curious to know, like, are there obvious criteria that you hear people say or watch people do that tells you really quick whether you're encountering someone who's intentionally going on the pathway of transition or unintentionally being forced to change? Like, are, are there are there recurring signals that you see each time? Well, it's interesting because there could be a forced and an unforced transition. Um, you know, but I think very often, you know, when I get to have coaching conversations with folks that are in transition, very often the conversation is very, very past oriented in terms of this is what I was doing. This is why I was frustrated. This is all of those things. 
Mm-hmm. And um, and what's not there is, or so what is there is kind of what they're running from and a lack of clarity, like you talked about earlier, on what they want to run towards because they haven't defined success. They haven't talked about what success looks like, but more importantly, what it feels like. And so so that's probably one bucket. Another bucket is around like the self-management piece in terms of a lack of boundaries, a lack of prioritization. They don't have the time that they want. They have it. They don't, and I, and I don't use the term very often, but they don't have the balance that they're looking for, the work-life balance. And the term that I like to use is the work-life integration. Yeah. Um, so not defining success, not knowing what they want to run towards, not having the work-life integration that they're looking for. Uh, those are like the big three mm-hmm. that I've seen. And, you know, whether it's clarity, right? Clarity in terms of what what do you want to focus on? Alignment, right? Because doesn't much matter, but we only have a finite amount of energy, attention, and effort, Mm -hmm. despite how much we think we can do anything. We can't, right? So there's a finite amount of our energy, attention, and effort. And without that clarity, you can't focus Mm -hmm. that energy, attention, and effort. And then one of the other things that, I would say, I guess there's four buckets is there needs to be some sort of structure that allows people to have the predictability and accountability that they need in their personal and professional lives to get them where they want to go. Masterminds do that. (laughs) And I have absolutely been, you know, have had the positive byproduct of that structure of accountability, predictability, and everything else. Yeah. You know, I was thinking um, back to when we were working uh, on that project, Dennis, and I remember you telling, it suddenly jogged my memory, um, that when you made your big transition that was at the, you know, from, from the Navy back to civilian life, a lot of those things just weren't even on your radar. And that's part of the that I, if I recall correctly, that was part of the pain that led you to become obsessed with understanding how to do this much in a much less chaotic and, uh, you know, what would you say? Draining sort of fashion. It really, it really sucked the life out of you for a while. And, you know, I was, and that's why I talk about resilience as much as I do. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there are different components of, of resilience that, we have to pay attention to, right? Because you talked about the slump, you talked about getting, you know, having the energy drain for me, but where did I get a lot of the energy that I needed to move forward faster? It wasn't from me. Yeah. It was actually from the people around me. It was my tribe, guys yeah. like you. Yeah. Sometimes we have to do that too. Like I think, uh, in the transition I went through from, you know, working a job and being in the insurance business and, and all that into entrepreneurship, there were a lot of days where I just, I was like, what's the point of all this? Yeah. I may as well go back, just go find another job. And anytime I shared that with any of my close associates at the time, they said, no, 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 no. You, you keep going. My bride was like, "Uh uh-uh, you didn't, you spent a ton of money and time on this. You're going to finish it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, as long as, as long as everybody still believes in me, then I guess I can keep going. A hundred percent. And and I know we've talked about it and I I like to say, and it's probably because I played football, I played lacrosse, I played rugby, but life is a context sport. Yeah. Right. We're going to get knocked down period. Full stop. But life is also a team sport. Mm-hmm. And 
one of the cool things about that is that we get to pick our team. Yeah. It's a choice <laughs> that we get to make of who is on it, who is not on it. And, and I know you've heard me talk about this more than once, and it's a military term, but establishing that QRF yeah. for, your, for your life is one of the most important things that you can do uh, in making sure that you have those five to 10 people that are going to support you, that are going to provide you with the accountability that you need, but also that the energy, you know, provide you with the energy that you need. Yeah. For all of our uh, non-military listeners, by the way, um, military guys love acronyms. And so QRF means quick response force. Um, that's a, a term we used. Um, I don't know if the Navy used it a lot, Dennis, but I use it a lot in the Army for sure. Yeah, well, the um, we had um, on ships, we had damage control teams and we also had force protection teams. Okay. So for, for damage control and then for, you know, anti-terrorism force protection reasons. So we had, we had those and whether you were in port or at sea, you know, those are all, always established. Right? right. And just like in life, you know, when you hear, you know, the sirens go off, you know, that there's going to be people that show yeah. up. Yeah. People that you could depend on. Yeah. As soon as as soon as rockets landed in the perimeter of our of our bases in Iraq, there were people who literally their job was to keep a ready, fueled, um, you know, armed, fully staffed Humvee or or group of Humvees to rush to wherever that had happened. Yep. In case there was a breach in the wall or something like that, and um, they 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 did it for a full year. Yeah. So the writing process, I'm curious as you dig, dig, as we dig into the nature of your book and the topics, what was the process like for you to get this on the paper? I know it's different for everybody. Walk us through yours. Well, at first I didn't have a process at all. Uh, I just started writing stuff. Uh, and then I think one of the big things in life is, are you, are you seeking counsel or are you seeking opinion? Yeah. And I started seeking counsel from folks that had written books. And they said, you know what? You got to get a process, dude. And uh, whether that's, you know what, just turn on the recording on your phone because you know, most of my thoughts actually came when I was either walking my dog, you know, running or whatever. And, you know, thoughts, thoughts while walking, thoughts while running and all that stuff. And didn't always have something to write, or, you know, to write with or write stuff down. Uh, but making sure that there was, there was first there was structure uh, and then there was a process. And once that happened, it was a lot easier to get my thoughts, collect my thoughts and share my thoughts. Yeah. I like the distinction you make between opinion and counsel. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Right. You could you could ask a bunch of people that haven't written a book, hey, what what do you think? Mm -hmm. That's great. They have zero context. They have zero I don't want to say they don't have any credibility, but from an authorship perspective, they don't. Yeah. So are you going to seek counsel from those that have the experience, that have the perspective, that have the credibility, or are you just going to ask somebody for their opinion? I, I especially like it because it's an empowering change in language. It's, I think many times we reach out to a friend, hey, I just want to run this by you. But we don't understand, are we asking for their opinion or are we asking for their counsel? Mm -hmm. And it would seem that, like you talk about, uh, a person who... Um, a person who does who has not been there uh, has an opinion, and it's interesting and also valueless up against somebody who has been there, and they would give you counsel. They will tell you, you know, what it's like. I mean, for instance, you you two gentlemen are you know from military, and I'm not, and so when Paul talks about, hey, you know, the 
rockets landing outside the base. It's like, okay, that's fine. I've seen that in a movie. And you both know that, well, don't ask for Jason's opinion on what to do in that, that time, because it doesn't matter. Jason's only mm-hmm. seen it in the movies. And, you know, like my, I think it was fifth grade. Now that was not true. It, it happened in fifth grade as well, but it was actually up in, up into high school. I had a high school English teacher who gave us a test on some book and, uh, I answered the questions as I thought I should answer them. And she promptly told me I was wrong. And she said, no, that is in the movie, not the book. You clearly didn't read the book. And I was like, what me? I didn't read the book. So, so it's interesting. We all have the opportunity to write the, to write our answers to the test, but some of us know what we're talking about and some of us don't. How Mm -hmm. did you make the determination of who to ask for counsel and who was just offering an opinion? Exactly that. Who had written a book before? No. So that's a huge distinction from the people who are like, Hey, I think you should write a book. And you're like, maybe, but what do you know? (laughs) Well, so I I think there's two things there, right? Yeah. Walk Uh, us through it. Because there were people that said, you need to write a book. And they weren't saying that because they had written a book. But they were saying that because they were, you have a story. Yeah. You got a story that people need to hear because I know the story. Mm. I live the story and I know the benefit that it could have. Right. So, so that's different than, Hey, you ought to write a book because of X, Y, or Z. And then once you to make that decision, I want to write a book. You need to talk to the people that have actually done the deed. Yeah. Cause I didn't realize how difficult and you know, the book I wrote is not very large, right? But the, the, the process of writing, mm-hmm. at least for me, wasn't easy, but it was cathartic. Yeah. So what is, um, this is, this is one of our favorite questions to ask our authors, Dennis, and I know you'll have a good answer for it. Well, you're setting me up now. All right. <laughs> yeah. No pressure. Yeah. Don't no, screw that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They've been amazing answers up till now. So I'm yeah. really yeah. hoping it. This could be the, this could be the end of it though. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not on your life. The bar so I could just trip over it. Come on. Not on your life, Dennis. I know you too well to know that this, that this will be a disappointing answer, but. The question we ask is, what is the message of hope that your, that, that is communicated in your book? What, what, what do you, when, when people pick this up and they read it, what is the hope that you want them to feel that maybe you didn't feel like when you went through that whole first transition? I think the big thing is that anything's possible. Anything's possible if you take the time. It goes back to some of the things that we've already talked about. Anything is possible if you take the time to reflect on what really matters to you, define it, share it, and do it. Hmm. If you want to change the world, you need to start your own backyard. Yeah. And the only way to start in your own backyard is to give yourself the time and space to identify what really and truly matters to you, why it matters to you, and what you're going to do about it. Mm. So coupled with that then, what's your advice to an author who is considering writing a book? First, ask if they have an Amazon Prime membership. Okay. And then tell them to get on their Amazon account, order a Nike Just Do It t-shirt, and have it sent to them overnight. (laughs) Yeah. And then that Amazon Prime membership, you know, then people will know where to get their book. But the (laughs) the first step, is to do it. Mm. 
Yeah. So you're a believer in the, uh, the old adage, the difference between those who do and those who don't is those who do do and those who don't don't pretty much. And it's the start of everything, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not, too. Nothing ever got done by a person who didn't. No. hundred <laughs> percent. There is no try. Do or do not. Yeah. There's a little green guy that said that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, and, you know, and I hear that very, you know, when, uh, when, when I, when I get the opportunity to coach folks that continually talk about stuff mm-hmm. rather than be about stuff, you know, I do tell them you need to get your baby Yoda on and actually stop, stop trying and just do it. Yeah. You know what I think happens, um, certainly what happens to me is that, uh, over a period of time, I, you know, we accumulate a, a set of a body of experience, knowledge and all of that. And, um, if you're like me, you'll spend, uh, whenever, whenever my family's not here, you'll spend, um, quite a bit of time walking around the house, pretending to preach it out loud to nobody. And, um, I said to myself, you know, I've got to, I've got to start capturing this stuff that I don't know why it keeps coming up for me, but it's the same stories over and over again. You know, it's the same principles over and over again. I go through an experience in a day. I, you know, the other day I had this very successful persuasive exchange with my two sons. And I, I said, that felt really good because they, they both said yes to what I was suggesting, which they don't do very often. And then I said to myself, why does that work? Why did that work this time when so many other times it hasn't? And I thought about it and I said, well, part of the reason is I thought about it beforehand and I decided what approach I was going to take before I did it. So I was proceeding with some of that intentionality you're talking about there, right? I wanted a positive outcome. So I knew what success looked like. And then I decided how I was going to go about doing that. I was going to take a different approach than I did. Well, the, 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 the further reaching, um, implication of this was that I suddenly realized this is, this is a principle. This is an eternal principle I've tapped into here and I have a name for it and I have stories that back it up and I have a way of expressing it. And now I've discovered voice dictation on my phone, on my notes app. So I dictated an entire book chapter about it in probably about 45 minutes. And, and, and I discovered that dictation about three or four days ago. I've written six chapters in the last four days for this book that I'm planning. I've been putting that book off for years because I'm too busy writing other people's books. <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, uh, this stuff is going to come up for you. This stuff that is really important for you, you're going to find yourself thinking about it. Maybe if you're like me, you walk around practicing monologues out loud to nobody. Um, well, you, but, you have a voice for radio. I have a face for radio. So that's a difference. Th- that's, that's the thing is if you like the sound of your own voice, it's helpful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, it's going to bubble up for you. It, it, the things that matter to you are, are, they're always there. And so you, you have to grab a hold of them and figure out a way to get them on paper. And even if it's sloppy, it doesn't matter. There's plenty of good editors out there, but as you say, right. Most people keep it bottled up in here or they like me, they spew it out into the atmosphere, but nothing, nothing comes back. And so the the process of putting it concrete on paper and then taking it through to fruition the way you did, uh, is, is what completes that transition. And what I will tell you and is, and for all the, soon to be authors out there is I still remember the day when I was about to hit send on my manuscript. Mm -hmm. I still remember like sweating, right? And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Just do it. And I did it. But I, there was a lot of angst. There was a lot of worry. There was a lot of fear about, well, how I'm putting this out into the world. 
And people are going to really know what I think. Mm. And you just got to be okay with that. Yeah. You got to be okay with yourself. And I, and I said earlier, right, you know, part of authorship, but also part of personal leadership is about connecting your head and your heart. Yeah. I think that's really good advice uh, to just go ahead and do it because nothing, nothing gets done until we take action. Uh, and there's no amount of pontificating to oneself that's going to write a book. So I'm happy to hear that Paul's actually, you know, putting these words down into some format that can be uh, sent someplace else other than his own brain or his yep. kitchen. Uh, <laughs> no, I know I'm getting it right when my friends tell me I'm pontificating, by the way. That's a great, that's one of my favorite words. And I know. It aptly describes how I am. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so Dennis, uh, as we're winding down here in our final moments, walk us through the, uh, just give us clearly and concisely the, the book transition on purpose, who's it for and where do people go find it? So transition on purpose is a, is really about personal leadership and it's about looking at change differently, understanding that change is a fact of life and transition. Moving from where you're at to where you want to go is a choice. And it's a choice that requires reflection. It requires awareness. But most of all, it requires action. Mm. Where do you find it? You can go to transitiononpurpose.com. You can go to dennis-volpe.com. Or you can go on Amazon and just put transition on purpose in there. And you know, one of the things, all, all the profits uh, that, that I make, from transition on purpose, actually go to two military veteran transition programs. One being Camp Resilience up here in uh, New Hampshire, uh, and the other one is Camp Southern Ground down in uh, Peachtree City, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Why? Because both of those organizations helped me in my transition. Yeah. That's awesome, awesome. Dennis. <clears throat> and with that, We've been talking with my friend, Dennis Volpe, author of Transition on Purpose, and, a, and now a, a, found, a partner, I understand, at the Leadership Research Institute and a, a coach to uh, military and civilian people who are going through transitions in their lives. Dennis, it's been great to have you on the show. My name is Paul Edwards. My co-host, Jason Todd. We'll see you next time on the Emissary Authors Podcast.